Well, that circles back to you, circles back to the choir, and pretty soon what you have is the complete, every person in the room having an impact, being impacted by the music that you have led out in. We did a, a thing at, they used to have a thing in Colorado called Winterfest, where young people from all over the United States would go to Colorado and ski. And they would have programs on afternoons, Sabbath afternoons, and different music groups that would come. They invited our group to come, and they invited us to sing at, um, during supper. So here we are, a thousand kids in the gymnasium eating. Because nobody cares, and nobody's listening. And they're louder than you are. So we're thirsty, but somebody heard us sing, and they said, could you come and be a part of our program on Friday night, or Saturday night? You know, there are a couple of numbers that you could do. It's a story about Moses. And at the end, it's all about throwing down what you have, the rod of God, throwing it down. Your rod became the rod of God in, in, in the right hand. So we're singing this song, and we're getting toward the end, and I noticed off in the wings the other performers beginning to come out and watch and listen in the edges of the curtains on the stage, and they're watching and they're listening. And, and as we finish this song, and the last words are, throw it down. And that's a great lesson for all of us Christians. Throw it down. And before we could finish, the place erupted in applause. It was one of, the, one of the most spiritual moments I have ever experienced in my life. Because what happened was that circular, that circular spirit that, that developed from conductor to singers to congregation to conductor to singers to congregation, it grew in such a way that one of the highest moments of praising God I have ever experienced. So those are things that, that can happen when we, when we recognize that, that in our leadership we have the background, the knowledge, the, the pieces that we, that we must have to demand what we want out of the singers that are in front of us. Rehearsal strategy. Now this comes to your question. I'm sorry, what's your name? Darcel. Dar Darcel? Garcel. Garcel, thank you for your question. I have a strategy of rehearsal, and it really depends upon who your, who your singers are. If you have people that can sight read, oh, you know, blessed, blessed be the fruit of their parents' womb, because they, they, they are the people that really propel your group, those that know how to sight read. Sight reading today is becoming less and less and less of a skill than ever before. And so what do you do for people that don't read music? How, how do you proceed? How do you proceed as conductor? Rule number one, if I can, I will allow them to hear the spirit of the song. If I can find a good recording that reflects what I want, I'll let them hear that. Because if the first step that they have is pounding away at notes, they're not going to really know how these notes fit into what it is that we're trying to do. Now, if it's a song we know, or if it's an arrangement of a praise song or a hymn, they'll get it, and you may not need to do it with, in this case. But if you have an opportunity to play a recording of the piece that they have, and put that goal in front of them so that they catch the spirit of that song, then the notes that they're going to learn can make sense to them. You don't have to do it every time, but it really helps sometimes if you have a piece of music that, that probably would require them getting inspired about what the song is. The last thing you want are discouraged people because they're bogged down in the notes. The first step to getting any piece of music to be presented, they must know the notes. They have to learn the notes. How do you get people to learn the notes? In this day and age, there are a lot of electronic ways in which you can create for them recordings that have their part on them. You don't have to have put the words or have singers do it, but if you and your accompanist can get together and play their part, 
Uh, I used to put input into a computer program all of the parts, and then you could highlight the one that's the tenor line. You could highlight the one that's the soprano. You could highlight the one that, that you know, the sopranos don't always need it, but sometimes they do. You know, they, they, they get the benefit of the, of the melody you know, so much more. So you can help to create note learning by, by going the extra mile and create little recordings that they, that they, this is all part of preparation too, because if you know over the summer <clears throat> that you're going to have this many particular Sabbaths to sing and then a Christmas program, you begin working on your repertoire over the summer, you figure it out what you're going to do, you make sure, you don't always know who's going to show up. And one of the ways that you can help that is to make sure that you at least have some unison parts and some two-part men and women in many of the songs that you do. There's a lot of them out there that are just uh, uh, men and women or three-part. If you don't have any tenors, there's music that's S, A, B, soprano, alto, and bass or baritone. So you might have to go to a music store and you can ask someone there. Um, I think out here you have uh, J.W. Pepper. Um, J.W. Pepper, I've used them all my life, West Coast, Central U.S. They will help you to find certain anthems. And one of the great things about their library now is that they have recordings of the songs already there. So you can pick a song, go to their website, and play the song, and they will have, have, it, have it demonstrated there. It's a little tricky to download those, but if you have a little portable recorder, you just put it up to your little speaker there and you record that and then you can play it for the people. So the first step is note learning. <clears throat> Find a strategy for them to learn their notes. If they don't know their notes, you can't make a lot of music. Um, you can have a nice social time, you can have a, you know, a, a good uh, feel about everybody being there and, and it was a nice social event, but you're not going to get very far musically until people learn their notes. You might be able to spend some time separate if you might want to take one of the sections out or work on their part, take another section out, work on their part, or one of the things that, that works is to have someone help you, maybe an accompanist, another separate accompanist, and take soprano and alto out, work on the work their parts together, take tenor and bass together, and then bring them back together. Always bring them back together so that they hear what it is. And you might, you might choose to use just a section of a song to do that. And nail down that one section of the song. So note learning is, is critical. That's, that's step number one. You don't get into great expression until they have learned those notes and that they have learned where you want them to take the breath and where you want them to crescendo, where you want them to decrescendo, because as hard as you'll try, you'll never get them to read all the music. They may read the notes, they may read the words, but so many singers skip over any expressive devices that's there. They skip over when it says pianissimo. They skip over when it says crescendo. So mark those things. Um, I have an iPad that I use exclusively for conducting. And I have a, a program here, it's called, I'll tell you what it's called, it's called a PIA score. P-I-A, PIA score. And one of the beauties of it is that I can mark my music on the PIA score, and I can send it then to all of my choir members on a PDF file, and it has my markings on that score. I think it's five or six bucks to download that app, Pia Score. Uh, there's actually, and then professional musicians use it, and their little devices actually that you step on to turn the pages. I mean, it's that, it's that uh, involved. It has, uh, I, I can show any of you that have an interest when we have a break about the use of Pia Score. Uh, every, every piece of music that I ever use is there. I don't, I don't use paper anymore. You purchase the paper to preserve the copyright. And then you can then PDF, you can, on my phone, I have a, a PDF uh, app, uh, click, 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 and upload to my Dropbox, and then back here. There are other ways around it. If you, if you don't have Dropbox, if you don't know how to do that, that's fine. And I, you know, I'd be happy to help anyone uh, uh, figure out how to do some of these electronic things. You'll see a lot of my choir members with their iPad. 
And that's all they have, and they're just swiping the iPad page to page to page. There are actual there are actual settings that you can have where if you nod your head, the page will turn. But if you want to get real expressive as a singer, then oh, then you've lost your page, and you have to, you have to figure that out. But you could mark it like uh, with a pencil. You could mark it uh, just any way that uh, you would on, on regular paper. And I mark it in red because that that shows up. And I'll I'll, I'll show you some of that at the break. Just a couple of things before we go into the proper use and care of the voice. Um, there are times when, as a conductor, and particularly in rehearsal, you can model the sound that you want by, by using your own voice in singing. Uh, one of the advantages of the male voice is that uh, you can model both male and female sounds. It's a little harder for the, the women conductors to model uh, the male sound. Uh, you can, you can express in, in a lot of ways how to get that sound, but it's, it's a little bit harder. Uh, one other, let's see, one other item in performance, sometimes as a conductor, you need to step in and join with that section that may not be quite getting it the way you want to. And it's okay to use your voice in a way that is not easily recognized by the audience. Uh, but it's okay for you to step in and sing the part that may be not quite working. And I, and I do it all the time. Sometimes if I have uh, one of my tenors missing in my, in my group, I'll jump in and, and sing almost the entire concert uh, from the podium. They say, well, how do you conduct and, and do that? Well, after you perform a piece 20 times, 30 <coughs> times, uh, they pretty well know what to do and you can then join them in singing. Uh, I still conduct with my hands. Um, I haven't yet gotten to the point of standing off to the side and singing with them because I still want them uh, to, to remember and, and, and know certain things that I'll, that I'll be doing uh, uh, expressively with them. There is a lot of amazing things that happen that make us sing. The actuator is what causes the vibrator to vibrate, wherever that is. Could be a piano string, could be a, a clarinet reed, could be your vocal cords. But the actuator is whatever the energy is that causes that. For instance, on a piano, the actuator would be your finger pressing a key on a, a whatever note you want, and that hammer hits the string. So you have actuator and you have the vibrator. On a clarinet, the actuator is the breath coming out of your body into the reed, the mouthpiece, and the reed vibrates back and forth and the pitch is determined by the position of your fingers on the clarinet. Flute is a little more complicated, but again, it's the, the breath. And then the breath itself does a kind of flip-flop back and forth over that little the mouth plate and it goes back and forth so fast that it creates a vibration. The air is doing this. So that's how, a, uh, that's how the sound, the vibration, is on a flute. Human voice, air in the lungs, passing through the vocal cords. Breathing for a singer involves a lot of uh, areas of muscles in your body, but basically, you don't want to spend too much time worrying about the breath. I, I use less and less emphasis on breathing when I work with my singers. I want them to have a posture conducive to singing when you're seated. Well, the best posture of all, of course, is standing because your body is in a vertical <coughs> position. Because when you breathe, you draw air into the lungs, which presses down on the diaphragm, which compresses the abdominal muscles and creates a fullness around the middle of your body. If you're sitting, basically you have constricted that airspace and you can't press, the, the, the lungs cannot press down against the diaphragm, cannot push into the abdominal muscles very effectively when you're sitting. 
So if you must sit, I tend to have my singer sit as tall as they can toward the front edge of their chair with their knees as low as they possibly can sit comfortably. That tends to straighten out the body just a little bit and keeps it from being crimped. The worst thing is to sit back in a chair. Uh, well, actually, laid back can have its problems, but uh, uh, the worst thing you want is someone really cr sitting, you know, crunched down in, 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 a, in a posture like that. Because you need to make room for the air in your lungs. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions about what happens next. You do not push air out of your lungs with your diaphragm. People think that the diaphragm is there to push air out. Actually, it's not. The diaphragm is there to pull air in. The diaphragm pulls down and pulls air in. You've got other groups of muscles. You've got abdominal muscles. You have intercostal muscles. You have other parts of the, the musculature uh, that have to relax because they kick in then later to press the air out. And so what you tend to do is have this squeezing effect that presses the air or presses or creates pressure against the abdominal wall that pushes them up, creating pressure in the lungs. The pressure is then restricted by the vocal cords because the vocal cords acts like as if it were you had your fingers on the top of a balloon, <laughs> squeezing that little top of the balloon with the air pressure coming through. And so for the singer, uh, the, uh, the, the, the closed glottis, and by the way, the glottis, it's not an organ of the body, it's a space. Uh, uh, an open glottis, you have space between the vocal cords. A closed glottis, you have the vocal cords together. If you say it, go ahead, say it. Yes. It. You started with a closed glottis. It. You trapped the air below the vocal cords. The voice box is located right here. They're called the thyroretinoid muscles. If you touch the front of your throat, you can feel a little bump there. That's the front edge of the, vo of the voice box. If you, if you yawn, that voice box tends to go down. Go ahead. Put your fingertips there and take a nice yawn. It goes down. When you swallow, the voice box goes up. Why does it go up? Well, it wants to get out of the way because you don't want food going into your lungs. That's, that, that's not fun at all. I got, I got some hot sauce one time on one of my vocal cords. Froze it. Froze it. I had no voice. I, 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 I could hardly even whisper. Yeah, I, mean, I was probably eating too fast. Tell them just by looking at me that I like to be fast. So, when, when we do use the body as a mechanism for making music, for making vocal sounds, we have to recognize kind of what the components are, what the, what the processes are that allow us to be a good singer. So we have then on inhalation, what must happen is we must create relaxation in the midsection of the body so that the diaphragm can push the organs of the body downward and we get a little fat when we inhale. We, and we feel this way. If we're doing this, that's not going to help you. It's only going to create tension. That's called clavicular breathing because you're kind of raising it up here by the cloud. But you don't want to do that. You want to stand with the rib cage or you want to sit with the rib cage in a tall posture and you want to expand down here. And I saw someone yawning, and that's perfect because that means you were relaxed and you were relating to what I was talking about. This has to expand if you want to breathe correctly when you're singing. <coughs> yes? Um, my question is, I have um, back issues. Yes. And still always in chronic pain. So when I breathe, especially deep breathing, it causes. Okay. I would say cheat in every way you can. <laughs> breathe as deeply as your body will allow you to breathe. And, now, and don't worry 
if you're not doing what everybody else is doing. Just accommodate whatever whatever issue there, there may be. Yeah, and you'll be fine. So you, you've relaxed, you've filled the lower body with air. Then what makes it come out? It's the compression of these other muscles that I mentioned. And sometimes the diaphragm will come into play if you're controlling the air carefully. It can actually create a little bit of down pressure or back pressure to keep the air from ex uh, escaping too quickly. But that's the only, play, only way that the diaphragm comes into play when, when you sing, is that it can create a little bit of that, that back pressure by, by resisting the pressure from, from this. But many times the pressure is, is, uh, is, is, is sufficient at the, at the vocal cords. So you have this balloon thing that, that, that closes. The vocal cords are really interesting. They're, they're uh, two muscles that come together. And depending on the pitch that you want, they will either be completely together, or they will seal in a small open, well, not, they won't be stuck together. They'll be vibrating in their full length. I'll put it that way. But as you get higher and higher, you close from back to front, and see the front to back. It doesn't matter. But the area that's vibrating gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until maybe the vocal cord, by comparison, is this long. But the high pitch might only be utilizing this much vocal cord. And of course, the older you are to a point, your vocal cords continue to grow. Now. Uh, men's vocal cords usually stop growing around age 65 to 70. And then they begin shrinking. That's why many men have very older men have high voices. Women, on the other hand, their vocal cords never stop growing. And that's why many very old women have a very deep voice. Or they were a chronic smoker, one or two. <laughs> And so this has implications. Because the longer your vocal cords are, the harder it is for you to sing high. And the more you must practice to maintain the range that you once had as a singer. And there are other things that happen to our voices as we age. Um, the mucosal layers. There are three mucosal layers on our vocal cords they will not be as moist as they were when we were younger. Your, the, the linings of your body begin to dry out the older you get. That's just, that's just the, the natural way of, of sin on earth, I believe, is that uh, we, we lose some of that uh, fluidity in, in, the, in the smooth surfaces of our body. We also lose flexibility. And that's one of the reasons that we have vibrato issues with older singers, is we are beginning to lose flexibility. One of, my, <coughs> one of my biggest issues with my own voice right now is the fact that it is not as agile as it once was. I used to be able to sing the melismas in every valley from the Messiah really fast, you know. Oh, I can't do it as fast as I used to, and that just irritates me. So one of the, one of the most, prominent exercises that I do now is for flexibility. But I'll just, uh, or, uh, I have to do that, and I have to keep doing that, and I have to do it more often than I used to, because as I've aged, the flexibility of my voice is going away. But let's go back to breathing for a second, because we've really only talked about the start of moving, moving things out. I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to give you a take-home exercise. We could do it in here, but you look so comfortable. I'm not going to make you get up. It's, it's simply this: we don't use the capacity in our lungs on a regular basis unless we are engaged in a lot of physical activity that creates a great amount of cardio, where we're really breathing heavy and, and, and expanding the lungs to their deepest point. But we can learn to become more efficient with our voice, even without doing all of these cardio exercises. 
And if you were to stand up and walk around the room, every one of you could do that with no problem. And when that's easy enough to do, what you're doing is you're creating greater muscle uh, control and efficiency with the rate of exhalation. Uh, the inhalation isn't as important really as the exhalation, but it's just, it's just kind of good to make your lungs begin to develop that capacity. And when you can do four, go to six, go to seven. And I used to uh, teach some trumpet players that would do 12. And they, and I had an oboe player that could, I mean, it, oboe requires very little air, but a tremendous amount of control. And it would be more important for you to do that than to worry about the position of your stomach when you're singing. You know, I used to take from a, a fellow that was from over here, one of, my, one of my great mentors in my life, but he had a school of thought that came out of Westminster Choir College. That's just down the road here, I believe, isn't it, Westminster? It's, it's near... I'm sorry? Prison. Prison, right, right, right. But his thing was, you get into this, this kind of a posture where you're basically, you have the feeling that the air is coming in and out of your back. And it created a very dark, heavy, somber sound. They don't teach it quite that way now. That was back, I think, uh, John, uh, uh, Williamson was his name. John Henry, anyway. Uh, then somebody named Lynn took over, and they have other people now that, that don't quite have that same, same posture or that same uh, attitude toward breathing. But when you breathe, and when you are at the end of a phrase, there's a couple things I could just jump up and, and help you with, like right now, which is, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll, uh, I'll just use you as an illustrator, as an illustration. At the end of your phrase, never lose the concept that your tone isn't in motion. At the end of the phrase, think about it coming out of you. It just is in motion. Now, eventually you're going to run out of air. You're going to run out of air. We're all going to run out of air. But do you know what we do mostly when we get nervous? We stop breathing. We stop relaxing the abdominal wall. And then when we get to the end of the phrase, we don't hardly have enough air to finish it. We have to grab a breath. But if you think of that tone always being in motion, and when you have your choir, and if you're doing something, everybody is on a ooh right now. Ooh, join me, please. Now, I'm going to make you get softer and softer and softer. And all you're going to do is think about your tone being further and further away. Yeah, yeah. It's in motion. It moves. And it's hard to remember that when you are nervous about the song, you're nervous about who the clinician might be sitting in the bench in front of you. By the way, I love that song. Thank you for that. But, but to have... Your mind shift to that. You're moving away, you're moving away, you're moving away, you're getting further away, you're getting further away. You don't just say get softer. Mm. Getting softer. Ooh. And then you got a tone that's ugly. You're moving away, you're moving away. And and that does two things. Number one, it makes your body breathe the way it's supposed to. Your breath mechanism is working. And that's why I said earlier that I don't focus too much on what you do to breathe. I would rather focus on what the tone is doing and where the tone is going and where it's always in motion. But the second thing it does, it takes you out of your fear zone. At the end of the phrase, you're worried about yourself. But if you kind of go into a kind of a third dimension where you're almost watching yourself or listening to yourself get further and further away. It takes your, the, the focus of your brain out of that area that focuses on fear. And it puts it into an area, and they've done these fMRIs where they look at people's brains, and when you move into this area where you begin to focus on technique and techniques that you've learned, and you move out of this area where you've been concerned or you're fearful or you're scared, it actually shifts, it lights up a different part of your brain, takes it out of that fear place, puts it into a, a more cognitive, uh, a controlled sort of creative area, 
that allows you to be a better musician because you've taken that area out of the brain. If you stay in the, the fear area, you're setting yourself up for disaster, usually. So if you go then into this technique, and that's why great athletes, they will get into a zone. Their zone is technique. Their zone is not fear. Their zone is not the audience. I mean, you know, they'll, they'll uh, you know, come on, give me some applause, all that kind of thing. But when they're in that zone, they have frozen themselves into that area that allows their technique to be the most important thing at that point. So as your singers, as your singers, as your praise members, all of that, if you're doing that, and you're working with that, keep that in mind that you can just sing that, that last little bit so effectively, and then you can just finish it off like that. So breathing involves relaxation here, then compression, depending upon what the song is, and usually you don't have to tell people how to sing louder or how to sing more dynamic. You just express that you want that and then, and then you can, you usually will get it from people without having to tell them how to breathe. So, that's the source. Breathing is the source. The voice box, you have these two functions in the voice box. One is singing, the other is swallowing. Swallowing, the voice box tips up, a flap comes over and protects the lungs from food getting in. That's a no-no, as I mentioned. You don't want anything on your vocal cords. People say, don't drink milk because it'll get on your vocal cords. If milk is on your vocal cords, you're in a lot of trouble. Dairy, in many people, can produce extra phlegm or extra uh, inflammation. And when your cords are inflamed, that means that extra fluid has gone in there because it was irritating. Certain kinds of foods, things that people are allergic to. Uh, if you're ever hoarse, and we'll talk about vocal health here in a little bit, your cords have become swollen. And when your cords are swollen, you just don't have the same singing capacity. And pretty soon your voice will even go away when your cords have swollen. Sometimes, if you're on the verge, and if your physician says it's okay, uh, an over-the-counter anti-inflammatory can be helpful. If you've used your voice a lot, and, and you your cords are feeling a little swollen. Mine are feeling a little bit thick right now from having talked for a couple of hours. Uh, to take an uh, ibuprofen, I mean, that, that works in my body, although there are people that say it destroys your, uh, what is it, the, uh, the flora and fauna of your digestive system. So I'm not gonna tell you to do that, but I'll just tell you that, that it's anything that can help you in an emergency to, uh, to lessen the swelling of your cords you, you can consider. So we've got, uh, we've got the actuator, we've got the vibrator. When you get, you've seen tenors sing high and tight like this, their voice box is way up. A simple, a simple, generally, a simple technique of doing this will help those tenors not to, not to sing with that high, tight sound. Ah, when they get really high, Ah, you want kind of a more resonant, ringing sort of sound out of the tenders generally, sometimes more lyric. But a lot of that, this is emblematic or symptomatic of an elevated voice box. Now you, you don't want to get into the business of trying to control where the voice box is. You can conceptualize it more by saying, have the feeling that you've got a small orange, the space of a small orange in the back of your throat. Soft palate elevates, larynx stays down. Ah, ah. And generally speaking, the higher you go, the more elevated that soft palate should be. Get those really high notes up there free by that elevated soft palate. Low notes, you don't have to worry too much about the soft palate. But the, the, in general, for both tenors and sopranos particularly, if they're not giving you a free tone up there, they probably haven't had the concept of that soft palate elevating and, as it were, almost stretching sideways. It's almost like it goes out between the ears. Those of you that are sopranos that sing up high, you learned how to elevate that soft palate so that those upper notes are easier. If I had the time, I would vocalize you all and have you experience. Ah, let's just do it, okay? Here. <laughs> And the higher you go, the higher 
where you should feel the back of your throat. Ah, ah. It goes almost from ah to ah by the time you get to the top. Can sound the difference between ah and ah without getting too complex. It's an acoustic property that happens by virtue of the shape of your vocal tract, which is from your lips to your vocal cords. What is the shape of that? Are you allowing enough space for resonation to occur? Are you creating the voice production? in a way that allows the three areas of resonation to engage. And you have three. You have laryngeal pharynx resonation, you have oral pharynx resonation, and you have nasal pharynx resonation. You have three areas of resonation. Ideally, you want to engage in the low notes, primarily oral pharynx and laryngeal pharynx, with just a touch of nasal pharynx. If you take the, na and I'm not sing talking about singing through the nose, I'm talking about allowing the vibrations to feel like they're kind of behind the nose, maybe in the mask here, of the face. And so you, uh, if you do this, do that, you're beginning to throw uh, resonation into the front of the face. Now you're not gonna sing, you're not gonna sing that, I don't mean to apply that. But if you can't experience the nasopharynx resonation and, and without giving, each of you a voice lesson, it'd be probably hard for me to, to, to really demonstrate to each of you how that works. The nasopharynx resonation is what causes that ring in the voice. The oral pharynx and nasopharynx, I mean the, the nasopharynx gives the ring. Oral and laryngeal pharynx provide the depth necessary to allow the nasopharynx ring. When you listen to the, the, the almost any pop singer who has ever made it big, every opera singer and some of our praise artists today, they will have a consistency in their voice that is because they have determined where the resonating area in their head is, and they keep their voice in that resonating area. Michael Buble is, is, is one that just has that great, rich, he has a wonderful pop style that's similar to, uh, uh, was it Frank Sinatra or some of those guys, the old timer guys, but he keeps his voice resonant in that spot all the time. He's learned where that is and he focuses his resonation in that area all the time. You at first have to learn where it is and how to do it and a voice instructor can help you with that. But as a choir director, uh, you, can, you can illustrate resonation, you can ask for resonation, you can let them understand that there are three areas of resonation and if you don't know how to get to the nasal pharynx, one of the exercises that I've used, uh, it comes from a guy named Seth Riggs, who was the voice teacher to the stars in Hollywood. He has a book, it's called Speech Level Singing. You can buy a J.W. Pepper. Uh, and there are exercises there that point out the three areas of resonation. And, the, and to get to the nasal pharynx, he has his students do this exercise. <coughs> Nay, 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 where you really feel that, that resonation. Now, that's not the end of singing, but if you combine that with the oral, nay, 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 or the Lorenzo, nay, 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 you can go from nay, 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 you still have that ring that occurs in the voice, but you have the depth that goes with it to balance it out. And so, that's one of the best qualities that a choir can ever achieve is the unity of resonation or a group to find that unity. Now, one of the things that I do with groups, and I've conducted small groups for lots of years, or even in my elementary, I have, I have my elementary choir this year singing four-part a cappella harmony. 
I just love it. And they, this is not a select choir. These are just kids that had to take choir because they were required to. But I got into doing some, some four-part a cappella singing. And I began to develop their unity by making them sing in small circles. And when they're in that small circle, and I could do it here tonight, but we're going to run out of time and dinner will be served here in 20 minutes. So, right? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I'm getting hungry, so. <laughs> when you bring, if you, if you put your tenors, <laughs> both of them, into a little circle, I mean, that's kind of how it works. But it works with mixed groups too. What you want them to focus on is if they can hear someone in the group that has good resonation, has a good quality of voice, copy it. Try to find out how they're doing. Imagine what it must feel like for them to sing that way. Make them sing in a small group close enough that the sound bounces around the circle, eventually, and I guarantee this, you will come up with a unity of sound in that group. The altos, and, and here's a tip for the altos, and you want to write this down because this is, this, is, this, is worth, this is worth money. Altos have, have, have range issues just like tenors do. They're either in their speaking voice, la 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 la, 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 and then down into their chest voice. Well, the low part of the head voice is the weakest part of the alto voice, weakest part of the, any, any female voice until they've, they've been trained over and over, years and years of study. One of the best techniques for getting space in that sound of the low female voice is to conceptually have them think about the tone going out of the back of their head rather than out of the front. La 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 because what that does is it makes them have openness back here where it's important. The worst thing you can ever do is close down this area, this resonating area, or this this resonating chamber. When your vocal cords, or yeah, when your larynx is in its proper position and your throat is open, it is a very smooth tube. It's just, it's a beautiful thing that the Lord has created in our voices. It's a smooth tube, all the way up and out. And when you begin to swallow, this is what happens to that smooth tube. It closes, it pinches. And that open, nice swallow, or that open, nice uh, yawn, slight yawn feel, oh, begins to go away as you begin to swallow because it collapses the tube because it's trying to force food down into your stomach rather than the, the air coming out of your lungs. So, and, and, and the symptom of that is a raised larynx because as soon as that larynx is raised, you've engaged the swallowing muscles. You have yawning muscles and swallowing muscles. You don't want the swallowing muscles to get in the way of singing, ever. So we have the issue of resonation. We have actuator, vibrator, resonator. We have breathing. We have phonating. And we have resonating. And to bring that into a little circle of people, you can also get them to unify their vowels. The best, and I'll say this very carefully, the best choirs, are ethnic choirs. What? Yeah. You know why? Because they all pronounce their vowels the same way. You know who the, you know who the grand champion choirs have been over the last few years in these competitions? Filipinos. And my, my good friend uh, Bojo uh, Cajalco, uh, Ramon Cajalco, is their conductor. Uh, he I had the privilege of him studying with me for a little while when, when I was in the Philippines on a couple of tours. He takes his group every year over to sometimes China, sometimes Greece, and they have these national competitions. And one of the reasons that they win, first of all, they're all the same height. They are. You look at the choir, they're all the same height. And of course they dress the same, Men all have their haircuts the same. 
and they sound the same from person to person to person to person. They pronounce their vowels the same from person to person to person to person. To person. And in this melting pot that we have, the greatest challenge I have as a conductor, when I have like a festival choir or even with my men's chorus, I've got people from the South Pacific in my men's chorus. I've got people from Latino backgrounds. I've got African-Americans. Um, 